Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I would like to welcome you to the 12th lecture in ECE 3084 Signals and Systems offered in the summer 2020 semester. In lecture 10, we introduced the idea of convolution, and we went through a lot of complicated exposition to describe an approach to the bookkeeping of convolution operations called flipping and shifting. Then in lecture 11, we said, okay, well, sometimes we don't want to go through all this complication, but there are some special cases like involving a function with a delta function, a unit step function, or this weird doublet that's the derivative of delta function that lets us indicate derivatives in our system notation. And today we're going to look at a case of doing a full five region convolution again. But today we're going to look at convolving a particular kind of shape with another version of the same kind of shape called boxcars. And we'll see that the answers have a particular pattern that we can just pull out of our pocket instead of having to do all of this flipping and shifting business from scratch each time. Let's draw a couple of boxcars. I'll draw one that has an extent of five and another one that will convolve with that has an extent of two. The one that has the support of length five starting at zero, and I'm gonna start both of these at zero, we can generalize that later. Let's say this has height seven, and then our other function will say has height three. These are probably not perfectly to scale, but whatever. So I'm gonna to try to figure out what the result of this convolution looks like without actually writing out any formulas. So I know that because these functions both start at zero, the answer to the convolution will also start at zero because zero plus zero equals zero. I know that the convolution is going to have length seven because the extents of the functions I'm convolving add up to five plus two equals seven. And also if I look at just where the right edge of the support of these functions are and add those up five plus two, that equals seven, the right edge of the support of the result of the convolution. So the axes here are all in terms of t. Now I'm going to make some copies of this axis that are going to represent functions in terms of tau. So all of these axes are going to be in terms of the tau time variable that we're going to integrate out to get the answer for various t's. Just to call them something, how about we'll call this xt and we'll call this function over here h of t. I need to pick one of these blocks to be the one that stays stationary and the other to be the one that I flip and shift. Just because I think it's easier to see what's going on, I'm going to pick the x block, the yellow block here, to be stationary. Notice this function here, this function here are the same. I just, for whatever reason, drew the tick lines here to have wider spacing than up here. And all of these yellow blocks have height seven. So I've drawn six version of the axes here. To avoid things getting cluttered, I'm only going to write this seven once. And let me draw in a few different cases. So I have a case of no overlap on the left, and I've drawn this to be right on the transition point of partial overlap on the left. And then the block will keep cruising along to the right as t increases until we are right on the transition of the case of complete overlap, where the time extent of the shorter block is completely enveloped by the support of the larger block. And this will go on for a while where the block is continuing to move to the right as t increases. And then it eventually hits the point where it's about to transition to the partial overlap on the right case. And then it'll keep cruising along. And then it will be right on that transition of the no overlap case, after which it will keep going. The left edge of the sliding block will be at t minus 2. And the right edge of the sliding block will be at t. That's what we get from flipping h. So in this first graph, we see what it looks like for the case of t equals 0. And we know that's where our convolution is going to start, so let's draw that in. And then I'm just going to think for a second about increasing t, and then imagine this block sliding to the right as t increases, and see where the transition points happen. Before this point, everything here is 0, and then it's going to hit this transition point, and the block slides along, and how far does it have to go until it hits this total overlap case? That tells us the extent of this partial overlap case. It's going to basically have to slide whatever the length of the smaller block is. So here it's sliding ahead one, two time units. So I'm just going to mark that here. We'll figure out what to draw here a little later. 
Now let's ask the same question. I have this big region where we have complete overlap. The extent of the shorter block is contained within the extent of the larger block. How far does it have to slide until we hit this edge here and then start the partial overlap on the right case? Basically, it needs to go the length of time that's the length of the longer block minus the length of the shorter block. It will need to go like one, two, three time units in this case. We've got five minus two is equal to three. So that's going to be the length of this particular case of full overlap. So I'm going to mark that there. So now we're at the edge of the full overlap region on the right. Once we're into the partial overlap region, how far does it need to go until we're into the no overlap on the right case? Well, again, it's the length of the smaller block. So it's going to go one, two units to the right. And then after that, it's going to be zero. So let's think for a moment about what happens in this middle case. So let's use the graph in the lower left-hand corner for a second. Let's draw another tau axis. I'm using a different color because this axis that is as badly drawn as my other axes is going to serve a slightly different purpose. On the orange axes, I was plotting the individual functions. We had a stationary block of height 7. We had a slidey block of height 3. So what I want to draw on the purple axis is the result of the pointwise multiplication of these two functions. All of the places to the right of the shorter block are going to be zero because even though I have some material here from the longer block, the yellow block, it's getting multiplied by zero. Anything to the left of the slidey block is going to get cut off and be zero. And remember what the underlying formula of the convolution is. Here it's going to be x of tau, that's what we're leaving stationary, that's this guy, and then the h of t minus tau. So this is the integral that we're doing. The tau is the axis upon which we're multiplying the two functions, and t is what we use to move the green block to the left or right. So what is the result going to look like? Well, it's going to be a block of width 2 that we have here, and the height is going to be 3 times 7, which gives us 21. So we have a rectangle of height 21, and what's the width of it? Well, the width is going to be 2. So what's the integral of this function? Well, it's a rectangle. The integral is just the area. So I've got a height of 21 and the width of 2. So 21 times 2 is equal to 42. So that, in addition to being the answer to the great question of life, the universe, and everything, is also the height of our convolution in this middle case of total overlap. So the height here is going to be 42. And it's a constant in here because notice that no matter how much our shorter function is shifting left and right, as long as it's living within the longer rectangle, the result of this pointwise multiply is going to be the same rectangle with the same height and the same width. It's just happening at a different time instant. And now let's think about what is happening in between here. If you think about one of these blocks sliding around in the partial overlap case, Essentially what you're doing is you've got some kind of integral of a constant. That integral of the constant is going to give you some kind of function that's quote-unquote linear, and want to be careful to say linear in the sense of a line, not linear in the sense of a property of a system. And another thing to notice if you're looking at the way these blocks are sliding around, as I mentioned earlier, the only way you're going to get something like a jump out of a convolution is if you have a delta function in something that you're convolving. Otherwise, all of the different cases that you have have to match up at the transition points. So we know we need something that's a line, and it needs to match up the transition points. So it's going to look like this in between. So if you have two boxcars and you convolve them, you get a trapezoid. The height of the trapezoid is going to be the result of multiplying the heights of the individual blocks times the width of the smaller block, then you just connect the dots between the endpoints of the result and the roof of the trapezoid. Okay, so earlier I promised to tell you what to do if the left edges of your functions don't start at zero. So let's say this was actually 10, and this was 11, and this was 12, and this is 13, and this is 14, and this is 15. So I'm just feeling lazy there. Here, let's be a little more creative and make this into an 8, and make this into a 9, and then make this into a 10. 
Okay, no problem. All I have to do is start this now at 18, 10 plus 8. And I know it will end at 15 plus 10, which is at 25. And there you go. Remember, convolution is a linear time invariant operation. So anytime there's shifts going on, you can apply those shifts wherever it is most convenient. All right, so let's do one more example. Here, I would like to do an example where we convolve two functions of the same length. Suppose I have a function of length 3 that is going from minus 4 to minus 1, and we'll convolve that with a function that is going from, say, minus 2 to 1. I know that the output of my convolution is going to start from minus 6, and it's going to end at 0. The minus 6 comes from minus 4 plus minus 2 is equal to minus 6. I need to pick the height of the couple of functions that I'm going to convolve. Let's say this is 4, and let's say the rectangle here is going to have height 3. So both of these have length 3, so 3 plus 3 equals 6, which is the length of my result. The interesting thing about this is if you think about picking either of these and flipping and shifting it, it's going to take that many time units to get from the no overlap case to the total overlap case, and the same amount of time units to get from the total overlap case to the no overlap case. Essentially, the top of the trapezoid in the example we did up here, that is a single point. So this five region convolution problem actually turns into a four region convolution problem because that middle case collapses. So we wind up with a triangle. In this case, the height of this block is 4. The height of the second block here is 3. So I'm multiplying the heights of the blocks. And now I need to multiply that by the width of the block, which here is 3. All of this together gives us, let's see, 12 times 3 is 36. So the height here is at 36.